This week on the Wake and Bake podcast. What I always tell people is that no matter what you figure out, if there is some benefit here, you're going to have a natural medicine that is very unlikely to harm your child in the long run and can really make a difference. There's this myth that these kids are all walking around stoned and that is so not what is going on. It's so refreshing to hear from a doctor. Hey, I do not have the magic dose here for you. The data supports the use of cannabis and autism because it looks like there are endocannabinoid system dysfunctions in autism. What issues do kids with autism have? Brain, gut, immune system. Where's the endocannabinoid system heavily populating? Brain, gut, immune system. I mean, there's so much overlap. Do you have a success story in your head? Improve speech. Going from nonverbal to verbal. How about food rigidity? I have parents saying my child has been eating the same three foods for the last five years, and now my child's tried broccoli for the first time. These are very exciting milestones, right? Because it's allowing basically different connections in the brain. And lots of parents reporting, my child just seems happier. Why aren't my colleagues embracing this? Welcome back to season two of the Wake and Bake podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, season two is going to be a little bit different than season one. In season one, Andrea and I talked to each other about cannabis. It was our goal to share these conversations that we were having about what we were learning with our combined 15 years of experience as cannabis educators and coaches. But for season two, we decided to get way bigger and way nerdier and call on our favorite physicians and researchers, clinicians and cannabis professionals to answer our burning questions about cannabis. These are the things that we wanted to know more about, and we are so excited to share them with you. And our first episode is a big one. This is actually probably our most highly anticipated podcast. We got to sit down with Dr. Bonnie Goldstein to talk about her experience using cannabis to help kids who have autism and epilepsy. Not only is Dr. Goldstein one of our personal lady heroes, she has been working in the field for years as a cannabis clinician directly with pediatric patients. Yeah, that's what I love about this interview with Dr. Goldstein. She's not talking about how cannabis could work or how, what the research shows that it could potentially do. What she's sharing with us is real on the ground experience of what she's seen happen when she's treating kids with autism and epilepsy with cannabis. This is real world experience. In season two, we're doing something else a little different and we're giving every episode a level on the nerdiness scale so that you know how nerdy this one is gonna be. Andrea, what would you give this episode on the nerdiness scale from one to 10? This one I'm going to say is a seven. It is dense and you might want to listen to this a couple of times, but one of the things that Dr. Goldstein is amazing at is making cannabis science accessible to the rest of us. So even if you're new to using cannabis for health, you'll probably be able to get a lot out of this podcast on your first listen. What about you, Corinne? Yeah, I agree. I think it's about a seven. And when we kept going through and editing this podcast, you and I had a lot of discussions about how we were going to make this even more accessible for parents who are navigating using cannabis for their children. And so as a bonus at the end of this episode, we're going to dive into what we would do if our child had a diagnosis of autism or epilepsy and how we would navigate using cannabis as medicine for them. Our hope is to ultimately make this a really practical resource for you if you're exploring using cannabis for your own child. We do want to point out, though, that Corinne and I are not doctors or healthcare practitioners. And even though Dr. Goldstein is, this podcast isn't meant to be medical advice. And if you are considering cannabis for your child, we'll give you some resources in order to get connected with a physician who can help you. And one last thing, we're still new to podcasting and the audio and video unfortunately suffered hard in this episode. We went in and re-recorded the audio, but some of the video is missing. Unfortunately, you can't see Andrea's lovely face in this episode, but she is still there. At any rate, we hope you love it and we hope that it helps. But before we get started today, I want to share some messages with you from the people and the companies who have made this episode possible. Here's a word from our sponsors. This episode of the Wake and Bake podcast is brought to you by the Cannabis Coaching Institute. The Cannabis Coaching Institute is currently enrolling for the Certified Cannabis Educator Program, a 12-week program that gives you everything you need to start helping others understand this powerful plant. The program includes an eight-week Cannabis Educator Program that is focused on science and taught to you by our very own 
lead cannabis science educator, Andrea Maharg. Not only will you learn everything that you need to learn in order to start helping others with cannabis, you'll also get our comprehensive business training so you can turn it into a side hustle or a full-blown career move. In as little as 12 weeks, you'll be able to step into the world as a confident cannabis educator, delivering workshops, hosting retreats, putting on podcasts, writing blog posts or books, and more. If you're interested and want to know more about starting this type of business, take our free class today, Three Steps to Launching a Cannabis Wellness Business. It is super fun and you can comment, it's interactive, and you also get a free gift at the end. Check out the link below or visit CannabisCoachingInstitute.com slash three, number three, steps. We'll see you inside. This episode is also brought to you by Ardent Cannabis, makers of the FX and the Mini. These cannabis kitchen gadgets help you get the perfect decarb and the perfect edibles and topicals in cannabis products every single time. I can't count how many times I've relied on the FX to set it and forget it when I'm making a lot of infusions. As a matter of fact, when I was moving from Colorado to Washington, I had two of these going and I made enough medicine to give out to my family members and friends before I left. And I was so thankful to have it at a time when I was so, so busy. If you make more than a couple of batches of brownies or a couple of things of tincture every year, then this is a device that will help you save money and make sure you get the perfect decarb every time. There are so many reasons why I love this gadget and use it over absolutely every gadget that I've ever tried, which is all of them. And the reason that I really love this one so much is because it's as easy as pushing a couple of buttons. You don't have to think, oh, what's the temperature for this thing? What's the temperature for that? It's done for you. I know that I'm going to get the most out of my plant material because Arden actually does lab tests on their device to make sure that it actually works. So I know without a doubt that everything I put into here is what I'm going to get out. I also love that I can get accessories for it, like the scent shield that will keep my apartment smelling like apartment or my house smelling like a house and the strainer so that I can just strain it in the device and go on with my life without having to use complicated straining methods. After I'm done, I just pop in the dishwasher. It is the best. I've been using this device for years now. I stand by it. They have a year warranty. Highly, highly recommend. Again, if you make more than a batch of brownies a year, this is the device. So where can I get one? I knew you would ask that. Click the link below and use the code Wake and Bake at checkout. When you check out and use that code, you get a discount and we get a kickback here at the podcast at no extra cost to you. That means that you're supporting a couple of kick-ass women-owned businesses. You're getting the best gadget on the face of the planet. I can't wait to see what you create with it. Hey, Wake and Bake listener. Do you want to know who my favorite cannabis educator is? Spoiler alert. It's Andrea Maharg. Now I'm popping in here because I know that Andrea is too Canadian and too polite to say, go look at all of my awesome stuff on YouTube. But I'm here to tell you that you need to go and check out all the stuff that she's made. She has hundreds of videos about cannabis and health. She's got recipes, DIY tips, interviews with cannabis professionals. It is amazing. So when this podcast is over today and you are missing her buttery, smooth, Canadian, sweet molasses voice, check out her YouTube channel. It's Reveal Cannabis. I'll put a link below. And I wanted to start out by welcoming Dr. Bonnie Goldstein to the Wake and Bake podcast and highlighting the fact that you're a clinician that actually works with this population. You're actually doing the work to help patients with autism. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you do? Yes. Thank you so much for having me. So I trained as a pediatrician and I went into pediatric emergency medicine, which, you know, adrenaline junkie, the whole thing. I loved it. You actually make a difference. You're saving lives and so on. I was burned out and went into a time in my life where I just like stepped back, which I think is a good thing when you're struggling. And during that time, someone close to me asked me about cannabis medicine. I knew nothing, started reading about it and was intrigued. And since then I have been a cannabis clinician and initially started seeing adults because it was kind of very taboo to see children. And there, this was well before the whole story about Charlotte Figgy came out. And then uh, right around the time that that uh, CNN documentary aired on TV, I ended up getting like inundated with pediatric patients. So that's how I ended up uh, basically being a cannabis specialist for children. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is such an incredible journey to get from, from where you started to here. So how did that turn into more of a specialization in autism? Initially, it was just really mostly kids with epilepsy. Some of them had a dual diagnosis of epilepsy and autism. And then the feedback you get is that, well, it's not just helping with the seizures, but it's helping with the autism symptoms as well. As you know, like moms who are struggling, dads, 
families that are struggling, they're up at night, stressed out. And where are they? They're on the internet. They're looking to see what other people are doing. The whole idea of cannabis spread like wildfire. I was just taking patients, taking patients. And when you are seeing patients and doing the work of what a doctor does all day, you learn about how the interventions that you're suggesting affect the patients. And these kids were seeing great results who had some autism as part of their multiple medical issues. And on then it just started becoming more autism patients. So I would say right now that epilepsy and autism, either separately or together as a dual diagnosis is the top uh, diagnosis I see in pediatrics. Um, I do see kids with advanced cancers. I see kids with gastrointestinal issues like either Crohn's, ulcerative colitis. I see teenagers with anxiety, depression, PTSD, um, but by far it's epilepsy and autism. And by the way, the scientific research that we have definitely supports the use of cannabinoids for epilepsy. That is really not disputable. Uh, the data that came out like over COVID, I think everybody was sitting at home writing papers and doing research, which was great, um, that all kind of coalesced. You know, if you think about CBD kind of Getting into the epilepsy community of pediatrics 2013, 2014, now we have almost 10 years of data that you can look at and put together and say, does this work? Is this safe? How effective is it? Who should take it? And that data is there. And so that definitely supports that. I think for autism, because I know of the safety and potential efficacy I have no problem helping a family who ha is struggling with a child with autism because I know the safety of the medicine. And as kind of a neurotic physician, I'm always kind of watching and I'm very, I'm very conservative with that whole start low dosing and only go to the dosing that, that um, is helping the child. You know, it's never, ever trying to get the child intoxicated. I mean, I think that there's this myth that because you're giving a child cannabis, well, what is cannabis? It's a whole bunch of things, right? But there's this myth that these kids are all walking around stoned and that is so not what is going on. The data supports the use of cannabis and autism because it looks like there are endocannabinoid system dysfunctions in autism. When you think about what issues do kids with autism have? Brain, gut, immune system. Where's the endocannabinoid system heavily populating? Brain, gut, immune system. I mean, there's so much overlap. And then just the clinical experience of parents calling me saying that, you know, they get the school report and the parent actually says, I think you mixed up my child with somebody else because that's not how my child behaves at home. In school, you start to see achievement and following directions and engaging and the parents are shocked by it. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I'd love to talk a little bit more about that. So we know that autism exists on a spectrum, right? And it can include a variety of different symptoms, like you said. It's in the brain, the gut, it's repetitive behaviors, obsession, delayed cognitive abilities, sleep issues, those kinds of things. There's a lot of different stuff going on, and it's clearly not the same for every patient. So in your practice, what kinds of things specifically have you seen cannabis help with in the autism population? That's a great question because there are so many parts to autism. So number one, it doesn't always work, but sleep seems to get better. I have families that have come to me and said, no one in this house has slept in seven years. Uh, we take turns sleeping. We hired a nanny to come to our house at night so we can sleep and function the next day. I mean, think about that. That's crazy, right? Um, how about we send the other kids to grandma's house to sleep because here at home, we're up, you know, pretty much up all night because our child's just pacing all night long, all night long. Um, so sleep is definitely number, number one or two. Aggression seems to respond to cannabis. Think about cannabis. What does it do? It's very calming, right? For most people, if you take the right dose, now don't overdose and get paranoid anxious. THC can help with aggression. CBD can help with aggression. CBG can help with aggression. I've seen CBDA help with aggression, THCA. So there's lots of cannabinoids. And if one doesn't work, that doesn't mean you're done. You move on to something else. In my book, I talk about ruling it in or ruling it out, right? You methodically go through the various cannabinoids to figure out what plant chemistry suits my child's chemistry because there is no one size fits all, right? Restlessness, irritability. Lots of parents reporting, 
my child just seems happier, right? Less rigidity, whether it comes to routine in like going, you know, even just driving in the car to school. If you go a different way, sometimes the, the, these kids freak out, right? Or you make a left instead of a right, or you stop at the drugstore after school and, you know, the your child flips because they're expecting their routine to be the same. How about food rigidity? You know, when I have parents saying my child has been eating the same three foods for the last five years, and now they're willing to try a slice of pizza. My child tried broccoli for the first time. These are very exciting milestones, right? Because it's allowing different, basically different connections in the brain. And it's also calming a lot of that neuro excitation of the brain firing. Um, other things that I have seen is um, and not in everybody, so not to make you know a big expectation, but improve speech, going from nonverbal to verbal or going from partially verbal to putting this together. Many children with autism only respond, if they do speak, they only respond to questions, right? They don't have spontaneous speech. I had one mom say, and brought me to tears. She said, every day when my son came out of school, how is school today? I never get a response. She said, one day I get I had fun, mom. And she said she almost like dropped to the ground in tears because she had that meaningful telling her what his experience was, right? So um, let's see what else. Um, tick behaviors, you know, if your child seems depressed, that can respond. Um, just so many things, you know, just kind of a global improvement. And I do think anxiety plays such a huge role. If you talk to lots of families who have kids with autism, they'll tell you their child has terrible social anxiety. They like being home. They don't necessarily like being out. Not all kids, but once they get used to a place, they do better. So imagine starting a new school, going to a new therapist, right? Going to a new doctor, um, going just any place new that creates a lot of problems. Um, in my office, there was a child who would get in the elevator. And the mom came up in tears and said, I have him sitting in the car with grandma because he just won't get in the elevator. I mean, I just think about these little things we take for granted that these people are struggling with. Um, I heard a whole bunch of little success stories in those. Do you have a success story in your head? Do you have a child that you can think of that made a huge impact on you as far as when you saw them responding to cannabis? Gosh, there's so many. I, I mean, there's one particular patient who came to me and now he's a young adult. Um, he, his mom had kept notebooks of pretty much every seizure. She documented everything. She was meticulous. And she came with this stack of notebooks for his, and he has epilepsy and autism. And she had every seizure documented, every medication change. He had been on multiple different medications. She's racking her brain. And this is something I see as a thread in my patients, cause and effect. Well, if I'm giving him this medicine, is it doing something? Is it making him worse? Is it not doing anything? And people, they get into this cycle of trying to figure this out. I feel so badly because, you know, epilepsy, autism too, very unpredictable. And I, you know, say that my families, until they get some improvement, they have not post-traumatic stress disorder. They have ongoing traumatic stress disorder because it's so unpredictable. Like I'm going to the grocery store. Is my kid going to end up on the floor with a seizure? Right. I mean, or am I in the car on the highway and my kid's strapped into a, you know, but this particular um, young man was having lots and lots of seizures just about daily. And he would go a maybe a couple of days, but he never went really a week without seizures and lots of different medications and when they came to me, he was actually in the process of trying to figure out if brain surgery would help him. So they were mapping his brain and we had our consultation. And this is very early on, like I want to say 2014. And we really just had at the time THC and CBD, but it was available and I was finding it to be effective for many patients. So they leave my office and I don't hear from them for the longest time. And the next time I connect with the family, the mom says, no, we haven't started it. And meanwhile, she's got another whole notebook full of seizures. And I just thought, what are you waiting for? So I kind of read her the riot act, riot act a little bit. I said, I understand with the mapping, you didn't want to change what they found in the brain. Because if brain surgery was going to be an option, I understand. But it looks like he's not a candidate. So let's just go for it. And this child was teenager responded incredibly. He got, as we worked up on the dose, 
I think it took maybe four to six months to find his sweet spot, which again, you know, it doesn't, it's not magic. Got to find this, the product that works, the dosing that works. You're trying to make sure you're not causing lots of side effects with the drug interactions or the other medications. So again, I mentioned I'm conservative. I take my time. We get there. He was seizure free for, for over three years. And then unfortunately, as we, his mom weaned some medication, I think there was, you know, she didn't reach out to me. I would have advised going up on the CBD to give him a buffer, but anyway, he had a breakthrough and then we had a little bit of a rough time. But meanwhile, let's just say right now he has, his seizures are far and few between. He is on CBD in a fairly high dose. And that's the other thing is you don't just give some CBD, you dose it milligram doses. There's enough information to understand that if you, if you're not seeing a benefit or only a partial benefit, it may be that you haven't gone high enough for, especially for epilepsy and autism as well. Um, he's on, so he's on CBD, he's on THC and very recently CBDV, which has knock on wood somewhere. He that he has not has a, had a seizure since we started CBDV and no breakthroughs, nothing. Um, some One of the things I'll share about epilepsy, one more thing is that not only does it help decrease the frequency or reduction of the number of seizures, what we're seeing too is less severe seizures, so less severity, um, shorter seizures, right? And then also a much quicker recovery. Parents will tell me it used to be a day, my child, after a seizure, it's exhausting to have a seizure. Your brain is over firing and you have what's called a postictal period where you fall asleep and really you lack energy, right? Um, parents are telling me that the postictal or, po or the recovery period is really short, like almost like, you know, he seemed kind of mellow for 20 minutes and he's up running around. That's huge. You get your life back. You don't lose a day, two days, three days of your child trying to recover from, from a bad seizure. And in autism, it's interesting. It's, it's not magic. It's not perfect. But when you have, like for this patient, he has autism as well. And what the mom says is he's just calmer. He doesn't perseverate as much. Um, his social interest has grown. He's very interested in being out and about. He was able to go to college and graduate, which is so exciting. And um he was even his school's mascot for their um, teams. I mean, you know, he got to participate in his life. And when I think back of those, I always think of those notebooks and kind of looking through them when the mom brought them. And I thought, oh my gosh, imagine living through this, not just now looking back at it, but oh, what a difficult life. And a plant made a difference. And I don't get why there's so much resistance still. You talked about a bunch of different cannabinoids and how if somebody doesn't respond well to CBD, maybe it's the dose, or maybe you need to add a different cannabinoid or switch one out to the other. This is something that people coming into the cannabis world often don't understand. And it's so refreshing to hear from a doctor, hey, I do not have the magic dose here for you. But now after working with patients for so long, you must have kind of a roadmap that you follow. Can you talk to us about where you start with dosage and in ingestion methods and different cannabinoids? Yeah, thank you for asking that question because it is a, a challenging one. I try very hard to not just have a roadmap that I follow for everyone because you have to take people's circumstances into account. But ultimately, it is trial and error because you never know what a particular human's baseline chemistry is, despite their, you know, your checkbox on the diagnosis. That's why, you know, I take a lot of history up front. I read their previous medical records to try to understand where are they coming from and then try to start somewhere that would be more helpful rather than just picking a, you know, a protocol and going there. But for the most part, for uh, children with epilepsy, I start with CBD. Um, for children with autism, in my experience, and I'll say it correlates with some of the studies that have come out of Israel, about 50% of kids are going to respond uh, who have autism to CBD for either low, medium, or high dose. Um, and then the other half are going to need to have some THC, THCA in the mix. 
Um, and that is because we know that children with autism, and this is documented in two very good studies, one from Stanford and one from Israel, that they have lower levels of their natural, what we call endocannabinoids, their inner cannabis-like compounds. And remember, those compounds serve the role to main balance of messaging. And if you have low levels of those, how are you balancing the messages in, their, in the brain? Those imbalanced messages are manifesting as seizures, manifesting as behaviors, manifesting as difficulties with basic things like eating and sleeping and interacting. So rather than kind of go the route of altering the neurotransmitters, we are trying to address the endocannabinoid system, which regulates the neurotransmitters, right? So that's the whole idea. And CBD works within that endocannabinoid system, also at receptors outside the endocannabinoid system. And I go with CBD because it's the one that we have the most data for, for epilepsy and autism, but also knowing that for some of these patients, THC is going to need to play a role because it mimics the action of endocannabinoids. And if you don't have endocannabinoids, are you ever going to get into balance? It's like saying to somebody, you have a thyroid imbalance. Let me give you a antidepressant. Um, no, that's not going to work. You're not hitting the target. You need to take something that's going to help replace um, the thyroid issue, right? And it's the same idea as we, as you know, someone who has Parkinson's, right? They are missing dopamine. You replace with dopamine. So CBD is where I go. You ask about dosing. I start very conservatively around one gram per kilo per day, two grams per kilo per day, because there's our children who are low dose responders. And the idea is minimal effective dose. If I slap them on 10 milligram per kilo per day, what if, remember this is out of pocket medicine. What if five milligram per kilo per day works for them? What if one milligram per kilo per day works for them? So I prepare the family by saying, we're gonna start low and titrate up. You're engaging me for a year of help, so it may take that long. So just, you know, get your expectations set. There's a handful of patients I'm sure we've all heard with the first dose, my child never had another seizure or, oh my gosh, this is manic magic for my child. But that's not the case for most. Okay. And, you know, I'm so happy for those families who have that, but that's not the case. Most of it is we are titrating up. We're trying to balance with other medications. We're trying to balance with, you know, timing is a before school, what if your child's in school all day, you know, then can, what if you need a dose in the afternoon, it's all of that trying to work through. It's a lot of work. CBD is the first. Now what's interesting about CBD, again, we have trials with a pharmaceutical CBD that tell us that for that product, the dosing range is 10 to 20 milligram per kilo of body weight. So if your child weighs let's just say 50 kilos, potentially your child may need a thousand milligrams a day of CBD. Now, cost effective wise, that's very difficult. Luckily, there are companies that do give discounts to patients. In California, we have the, you know, the legal dispensaries. Most of my patients using high dose CBD are going through the hemp market through very vetted oils that have been around a while who share their test results, who's products I buy and send to a lab to get tested. So I know for sure that I, I'm not recommending something where someone messed with the test results. Um, and there's a handful of companies that are quite good that have like basically shown us that they care about the end user and they don't change their product. It's the same thing, bottle to bottle to bottle so that it's medicine, right? Um, and so with CBD, I tend to titrate up. If I'm not really seeing great results by a reasonable amount, you know, eight to 12 milligram per kilo, you're not seeing really anything or you're seeing worsening, uh, I'll go in a different direction. But it is important to understand that it can take up to six days for that change that you make. Let's say you go up on the dose, it can take up to six days to that for that to reflect in the bloodstream. So you can't say, I changed the dose Monday and Wednesday, it's not working. You have to give it time. This is a botanical medicine. It's not a hammer like pharmaceuticals are. It nudges you in the right direction. So you have to give it a chance. So I usually don't make changes with CBD. And again, no hard and fast rules, depends on the situation, but at least a week or two weeks of observation to give it a chance to work. I also tell families to prepare that CBD has what we call biphasic effects. So low dose can be overstimulating for some patients or alerting. I have one mom I talked to yesterday, she calls him her nighttime party boy. And she's like, this is not working. And then as you go higher dose with CBD, it's more calming. 
This, this is very typical with cannabinoids, depending on the dose, they can have different effects. It's a very complex, you know, it's not a key and a lock only. We talk about that, but it's much more complex than that. If a child is, let's say a, a child with autism is highly aggressive just from the word go, and that's why they're in my office, I will include THC from the beginning. So usually I'll recommend a uh, lower CBD to THC ratio for someone where I'm saying, I'm just going to try CBD. It's usually like 25 parts CBD to one part THC. I never really use CBD isolate. I don't find it to be effective. That little bit of THC in there helps stimulate that receptor, not to mention it works at other very important receptors. Mother Nature packaged it a certain way for a reason. It's not dangerous to take a little bit of THC when you're taking this huge chunk of CBD along with it. CBD helps dampen down the, the THC, it modulates it, it lets it do its thing, but not as a full force binding to that receptor. I hope that makes sense. But there is this um, really beautiful kind of relationship with CBD and THC working together. Like we know in pain studies, CBD by itself, not so great. THC by itself, not so great. Put them together and you've hit the jackpot. So this whole idea of CBD being the good cannabinoid and THC, the bad cannabinoid, absolutely not. THC is an amazing medicine when used medically, really amazing. Uh, if those patients with aggression, like where that's the main issue, I just sometimes start four to one ratio. When THC plays a bigger role, you don't need as much CBD because the THC is doing some of the heavy lifting, right? If you're asking CBD to be the big you know, powerhouse, you're going to have to go higher dose. I've been using THCA and CBDA. Remember raw cannabinoids. These are amazing anti-inflammatories. And remember one of the underlying issues with epilepsy and autism, both is neuroinflammation, gut inflammation. These raw cannabinoids, although understudied and we don't have enough data on them, we at least have the data to show that they are potent inflammatories. They're also absorbed better by the body. They're a little less fat loving and a little more what we call um, uh, water soluble. So your body seems to absorb them better. So you don't need as big of a dose. Okay. And they also are not intoxicating. So there's that added benefit of, so you might be sensitive to the intoxicating effects. These are not intoxicating or impairing. There's also CBG on the market. CBG is cannabigerol. Lots of good research on CBG. Uh, Dr. Ethan Russo and a number of other people did a survey and published it on the last year, the year before. And it was just a survey, but it's meaningful. Pain, anxiety, depression, sleep. It was rated very highly, was basically non-intoxicating, which I have not found it to be intoxicating in my in my experience. Lower doses than CBD can be used. It has a few different targets in the brain and body that than CBD. Some overlap, but some different targets. And it was in this survey very highly rated. In fact, people reported being able to get off pharmaceuticals by using CBG. Um, in my practice, I find CBG to be helpful for anxiety, even in low doses especially when comboed with other cannabinoids, because you get this entourage effect where they kind of all assist each other. Um, and a very interesting thing about CBG with autism is that for about 30% of patients, it expands speech. And I can't tell you, you know, when I'm trying it, I don't know if it's going to work or not. There's like no test is, or is, you know, your child has, you know, brown hair, so they're going to respond to CBG. There's no way to know. You just try it and see. And again, CBG can be sometimes overstimulating for some patients and it's counterintuitive. If it's overstimulating at a low dose, why would I give more? They're going to be bouncing off the walls. No, higher doses can be more calming. That's just the funny thing about cannabinoids. And then just recently, I started using CBDV, cannabidivarin. It wasn't available on the market, and now it is since about maybe summertime when it kind of became obvious to me that patients could now purchase this in the hemp market. And I am just kind of blown away by the results. It, in Just yesterday, which I was excited about because I'm going to be talking to you today, I had a parent email me in the morning saying, I I'm holding my breath because we got through a pretty serious kind of difficulty that I know triggers seizures in my child and there were no seizures. And then I had another mom reach out, you know, the gut and the brain are so connected, right? We all know this. Um, a lot of children who get constipated, it will aggravate seizures or aggravate behavior. And I don't know if you've heard that before, but it's a big problem. 
um, and keeping their kids regular without a whole bunch of medicines is sometimes very difficult. And think sometimes too, in kids with autism, just their diet's not very varied. So they just don't have a great microbiome and there's dysfunctional bowel anyway, right? And then a very limited diet is not going to help. But I have one patient with autism who I was thinking about this boy, CBG is what keeps him, believe it or not, just keeps his bowels regular. It's kind of amazing. And then with CBDV, this one particular patient where the mom knows if she gets constipated, they're going to live through all these cluster seizures. Mom said, we saw one brief seizure and then she didn't go into those clusters. First time ever when she's constipated, we haven't seen that. And then the other thing about CBDV is I am adding it into an already existing regimen. I'm pretty sure that's why I'm seeing the results that I'm seeing. But I like a 10-year-old little girl with Dravet syndrome, two and a half months the longest she's gone without a seizure since she her diagnosis. This is amazing, right? And again, it's not magic. These compounds work at receptors and enzymes and so on in the brain and body the same way pharmaceuticals do. It's, it's when a pharmaceutical company develops a drug, they have a target in mind, of course. These cannabinoids target certain receptors, cannabinoid receptors and others. And so this whole idea, like I be believe or I don't believe in cannabis is nonsense. <laughs> it's, this is science. Um, I will say that I absolutely I'm in favor of a zillion more human clinical trials, but we have enough data to show that it is safe. And certainly if you are in a situation where there is nothing helping, my goodness, what have you got to lose, right? I didn't really answer your question of the, the kind of protocol. It kind of depends because if I give a child CBD and I see a response, then we get a fork in the road. Okay, should we continue with this or do we now add another cannabinoid? I try to not complicate with lots of variables all at once. Like I have parents that email me and say, can we just add in this? We have not explored the full dosing range and I understand you're struggling, but if we divert now to something else, then there's still this big question mark over here. So it, it can be rough though, because it is a tedious process. Um, but what I always tell people is that no matter what you figure out, if there is some benefit here, you're going to have a natural medicine that is very unlikely to harm your child in the long run and can really make a difference. You know, I just want to share with you, there was this report that came out in 21, I think it was, that showed that the longer you're on CBD for seizures, the better you do. That's amazing. I just tell people, this is mother nature. Like if I go vegan tomorrow or I hit the gym tomorrow, I am not healthier tomorrow night. It takes time. Like we always, you know, say that, you know, if you're working out, no one's really going to notice for three months. You got to give a natural option a chance. We've all become so used to the idea that I'm going to take a pill and be better in two days. And boy, do I wish it worked like that, but that's not really how it works. Wow. Thank you so much for all of that. That's incredible. Um, I do want to circle back around to something that you mentioned. We talked a little bit about THC, and you mentioned that in 50% of cases, it's necessary. I would say that the biggest question that I got when we solicited questions about THC and autism is that many of those questions were really intertwined with a lot of fears and beliefs that people have about this particular cannabinoid. One of the questions a parent specifically said was that she read THC will cause brain cells to go dormant, and she wanted to know if they could come back. She also mentioned that THC lowered IQ. So there's obviously this very real fear that THC will do more harm than good if you incorporate it, especially for things like brain function, for cognitive function. So can you speak to that? Is there any real reason to be concerned about using THC for children and long-term effects in the brain? Yeah, this is something that I hear all the time. So think about where we're getting the data from, right? So first there's propaganda. Remember that commercial, this is your brain on drugs and your the fried egg in the pan. Okay. So leaving that nonsense behind, when you look into the scientific literature about THC, who were the subjects of these studies where they report that it's bad for you, right? Or that it damages your brain or it does this or that? Chronic, heavy, THC, non-medical use with no medical supervision in a 15 to 25 year old age group, mostly boys or men, and just like all THC all the time. Well, if you inundate your endocannabinoid system with all THC all the time, guess what happens to your receptors, which you rely on to maintain homeostasis? They say, 
you know what? That's too much THC. I am over inundated. And they go from sitting on the cell wall and they hide inside the cell. And we call that downregulation of the cannabinoid receptors. When you downregulate, meaning you dial down how many cannabinoid receptors you have, now your inner cannabis, which controls your emotional state, your cognition, your memory, your learning, your re reward and addiction um, system, your sleep, your appetite, like everything basic to your being, you just eliminated that receptor. Where's your endocannabinoid going to go? It just is like floating around looking like, where'd they go? And what happens is with chronic heavy use, often, again, non-medical, because I would never recommend chronic heavy use in a patient that's just not in the realm of all that. I do a lot of things with cannabis, but I don't do that. It is not a good idea, especially if you're a person suffering from anxiety especially if you're a person suffering from pain, you've eliminated the target. That makes no sense, right? So those studies are studies of not medical supervised or medically knowledgeable people. I would, and my analogy is if I saw a 15 year old in my office with pneumonia, I would not say, here's the keys to the local drugstore, go pick your medicine and take as much as you want. That's just so silly. And when people say I self-medicate, I don't mind that if you know what you're doing, but I do mind that if you don't know what you're doing. So when we look at IQ points, it's something like eight IQ points in this chronic, heavy use, right? But the clear cut studies that show that when you take THC away and allow the endocannabinoid system to go back in, the system will recalibrate this um, down regulation of the receptors is not permanent. They pop right back up. And if you test people when they're under the influence of chronic heavy THC versus when they've abstained, they go right back to their baseline. And there's now a handful of studies that have come out by people who have made this their life's work to look at the effects of THC on brain development and on um, cognition and uh, emotionality and executive functioning, impulsivity, all these things that we look at. And even they come out and say, this may be genetics. This may be environmental factors as they're growing up. This may be dietary. This might be um, family issues, a social situation. Because really, how do you tease out right? My son is in his early 20s now, but when he was 15, I, I knew where he was and what he was doing. I'm not saying that you're a bad parent if your child goes out and hangs out with his friends and gets stoned and come home, but you need to have a conversation about their mental health. Why are they seeking out cannabis? You got to have the conversation because if you allow them to continue to quote, self-medicate in the teenage years when they don't know what they're doing. It's like saying, here's the keys to the pharmacy, have at it, just go take whatever you want and disregard the actual effect on you. What I have found in my medically supervised patients using THC is nothing but benefits unless the child just doesn't do well with THC and then we just kind of take it out. There's no reason to take something that doesn't help you. But with THC, you have to be careful because if it's the only compound you're using for your medical condition, if you're not careful in terms of being thoughtful about dosing, knowing how much you're using, or just being thoughtful kind of about use in general, like, do I really need it right now? You know what? My pain's a 10 out of 10. I do need it. But you know what? Let's say you come home from work and you're like, well, I'm not so bad. I, I Maybe I'll skip it. That kind of helps maintain your cannabinoid receptor system, right? Your endocannabinoid system and allow those receptors to not necessarily uh, build up tolerance. There's all different levels of tolerance. You know, there are people who have tolerance that's just a little bit and in a way that allows them to really get good results with THC because now they're tolerant to the memory loss part. And tolerance builds, it's very interesting. You get tolerance to THC um, at different rates in different parts of the brain. So like, for instance, I had a patient who um, she kept telling me, I feel like I just can't remember anything with THC use. She had full sclerosis and THC was very helpful for her spasticity, for her pain, for her sleep, for her appetite, all of the kind of things that that someone with chronic illness is dealing with. But she was upset about the memory stuff. And I said, okay, let's be a little bit more thoughtful about our use, right? And see if we can either change the product. We did a bunch of changes, dosing, timing, product. And what's interesting is that memory issue kind of went away. 
she was like, I feel like it's not an issue anymore. And I think what happened is that she just was able to find the sweet spot where she was still getting very good effects for the pain and the sleep and so on, but the memory wasn't as effective. I have to pay attention to all this. My colleague, Dr. Dustin Sulak in uh, Maine always says, you know, take an inventory before you use your cannabis, right? Take an internal inventory. How am I feeling? Am I content? Where am I at? Um, and I think that's very useful. Now, of course, we don't do that with children, right? We're, we're trying to treat them. But if you are using THC and you are concerned about these potential downside, it's really all about use patterns and you just have to be thoughtful about it. And one of the ways around tolerance so that you can get benefits of THC is to add some CBD into the mix. Let them both share the heavy lifting. You don't need as much THC. Often you get a beneficial effect and it appears that CBD helps minimize tolerance to THC. In the studies on Sativex, which is a one-to-one -one ratio CBD THC that's available in Europe for multiple sclerosis and advanced cancer pain, it's a pharmaceutical product not available in the United States. Um, they have, oh my gosh, tons of research on it. There's no tolerance. Just adding that CBD in there helps minimize tolerance. And again, going back to medical use, what is the point of taking a medicine that you build tolerance to and you lose the medicinal effects? It makes no sense whatsoever. In my practice on children using high-dose THC along with other cannabinoids, we are seeing learning. We are seeing progression of milestones. We are seeing the opposite of what these chronic heavy use reports are, are saying. So just to be clear about it, there should be no fear with medically supervised THC use. Thank you. That is so, so helpful. Is there an upper limit of THC with children? Do you get to a point where you're like, oh, this is too much to feel comfortable with administering to a child? It's not a specific dose. It's the child's response. In my book, I talk about what's called the ceiling dose. So we will titrate up. I am very careful with THC. I, in children, I use 0.5 milligram to one milligram increments. You go in teeny tiny increments because a little bit can make a big difference, right? I always tell the parents, if you see red eyes, giggling, sedation, you know, any of the things that we know that impairment or intoxicating uh, looks like, we, okay, you hit the ceiling dose. Too much, back up. What was the previous dose? Let's assess what that did for your child. So if you tell me that, when you do five milligrams, you're seeing less aggression, better sleep, just overall less social anxiety. Great. But at six milligrams, your child looks a little high and parents know. I mean, you can tell you're around your kid all the time, you know, six isn't the dose. Five is the dose. And if five doesn't do the trick, then we still have to support it with other cannabinoids. I had a, a child in my practice years ago with THC was the only compound that helped his seizures and his autism, but we ran into trouble where we would have to take a break. And who wants to have to take a break to reset receptors in a child that's having symptoms? Nothing else seemed to work. We tried everything and that was what worked for them. So we we tried to make it work and built in what we call holidays where you take a couple of days off and just pray that the seizures don't work. But ultimately, I don't find it to be a really great way to medicate somebody. I would have liked to have other cannabinoids in there, but he just, it seemed to aggravate him. So there is no dose. What's the highest dose of THC I've ever had a child on? 1500 milligrams a day for cancer. Um, I have a pediatric uh, autism patient who takes 300 milligrams of CBD a day and about 250 milligrams of THC a day. And people might say, why would he need so much? Well, when you give him less, you don't see any effect. It's only at this high effect. And remember, you don't absorb every milligram you take. In fact, absorption is horrifically low. It has terrible what we call bioavailability. It's between like 5 and 20%. And I venture to say that in someone who has gut issues, it's lower than 5%. So in order to get some into the system, you may have to go higher. Now, there are ways around this for some people. So some of my teenager patients have, um, we've educated families on how to use vaporizers so that they can get a little more efficient. It gets into the system a little more efficiently. Also, there are companies out there that kind of wrap the cannabinoids in a more water-soluble package. There's a lot of claims out there, but some of it is, I would think, scientifically valid because I do have families that use some of those products and they not only get in quicker, but you get a better result 
with a lower dose. I don't know if that's going to work for everybody. I just haven't used it that much. And when you think about how much people are paying for medicine, it seems kind of wasteful to think that you're only absorbing a small portion of it. But you have to remember, we're in the infancy of this. So we still have a lot of work to do to try to enhance the delivery methods. But in the meanwhile, we're seeing good results with this. And so in general, most people don't need mega high doses of THC. And if a family calls me and says, my child got intoxicated, we now learned what that dose is and we just don't do that again. And that one time is not going to change anything for that child. I think, you know, fast food is worse for your child than that one little blast of THC. How legal is it to give THC or CBD to a child in the United States or in North America? So in, in the United States, it depends on your state. So we have a lot of CBD only states. So you can get in trouble for giving your child THC here in California. If you're under the age of 21, you have to have a medical recommendation. You have to have seen a doctor. And I have had some cases where parents have been reported to Child Protective Services. And because I'm involved, there's non-issue. There's a responsible physician following the child. Um, there have been cases of children being taken away. And it's really unfortunate because, you know, we're handing out the atypical antipsychotics to these kids with no problem. And here's a plant medicine that's very safe, and especially under medical supervision. And, and we don't want families to have to go through the, that burden already on top of all the challenges. So it just depends on where you live. And it's unfortunate that we don't have enough doctors embracing this. There are doctors in just about every state in the United States. I know there's a wonderful pediatric uh, cannabis doctor named Dr. Jennifer Anderson in, in Canada. And here in the United States, I, I usually refer people to cannabisclinicians.org. It's a, it's a group called the Society of Cannabis Clinicians. And if you go on their website, they do have a list of physicians. Um, and then, you know, sometimes word of mouth asking other parents, who's helping you? Where are you going? What are you doing? And if you can't find an MD, there's lots of nurses out there that are doing cannabis coaching. There, And I find actually that doctors are the least interested <laughs> in learning. And I'm seeing a whole slew of people who want to be like nurse practitioners, nurses, other people who have healthcare backgrounds who want to be involved in helping patients use cannabis. So sometimes you may have to go a little bit outside as long as someone's being thoughtful, is taking a good history and being thoughtful about uh, what they're doing. Um, you're pretty likely to find some success. So I have one more question that's a little bit more about the role of cannabis educators and cannabis health coaches when it comes to getting the word out about things that cannabis can help with, like autism for children. Obviously, we're not medical providers, right? We're cannabis educators, and we're really passionate about this plant. So how can we and the students at the Cannabis Coaching Institute and others who are in a role where we're not in the medical field, but people come to us with questions. So how can we support this moving forward in terms of getting the word out and helping people understand how to use cannabis in this particular way? Well, I think you just have to keep talking to every single person, anybody who reaches out. I'll tell you from 2008 to now, that's my experience. In 2008, it was like taboo to even mention marijuana. Oh my God, what? You're giving marijuana? You're taking it? I mean, I didn't tell anybody what I was doing because I knew I was going to be judged. Like, what? Did she, has she lost her mind? That's what my colleagues in the medical world would probably say. We just have to keep talking about it. We have to stress the science. Every chance I get, and I even write in the book, someone who doesn't understand, I say, do you know about the endocannabinoid system? And this whole idea of everybody saying there's not enough research, let's stop saying that. As you guys know, I'm doing an educational program. I cannot get through all the research. It's too much. It is 12 hours a day on the weekends. And my husband's like, wow, you're, are you just reading the same article over and over again or what? I'm like, do you know how many articles there are on this? I said, I'm, I'm always blown away that there is this tremendous amount. And one of the things that makes me really sad is it takes 17 years for the scientific literature to get into a practitioner's hands. That is unacceptable. We must constantly talk about this, push people towards articles that help us understand and just really move past the reefer madness crazy mentality because this is medicine when it is used as medicine. 
I can't thank you enough for coming on here and like dropping all of these really poignant bombs on us. I have two kids, neither one of them have autism, but as you were speaking, I could feel my own shoulders relaxing for the parents who I hope are able to listen to this. So I really appreciate everything that you're doing in this space. We are so grateful to have been able to spend an hour with you. If you want to find Dr. Bonnie Goldstein, where should they go? So my website, it's it's either Bonnie Goldstein MD will take you to my main website, which is called Canna Centers. That's the name of my medical practice here in Los Angeles. Um, and then I have a book out called Cannabis is Medicine. Um, I didn't get a chance to talk about my autism research, but if you go to Google Scholar and you look up autism and put my name, you'll find a couple of articles that we've published on some groundbreaking technology and videos. I have a YouTube channel now, uh, Bonnie Goldstein, MD with no E on Bonnie and just trying to get the word out. Like what is CBDV? How do you use cannabis for epilepsy? Why does it help epilepsy? What about cannabis for autism? So those videos are out there to educate people. Thank you so much. We will link to all of that below. All right. Thank you very much for all of this. We appreciate you. Thank you guys. I'm not going to lie, Andrea. I know we were very excited about recording this podcast. I know that right afterwards we were both like on cloud nine, but looking back after all of these months, after recording it, I can honestly say that this podcast changed my life, right? It like opened up the world of CBDV for me. And I started growing CBDV plants. Um, I started having more eloquent conversations with my friends who had children with autism about cannabis. I really, I hope this podcast does for others what it did for me personally. I had the same experience as you, Corinne, about talking to my friends who have kids with autism. And I started to think about how overwhelming it might be as a parent who is walking into this brand new. So you and I thought that we could break it down into three, like kind of easy steps that are probably harder to take on the ground in order to see if cannabis is an option for your child. So step one, and the most important step, we can't hammer this home enough is that you get a recommendation recommendation in the United States or a prescription in Canada for your child to keep everything above board and legal. Your own family physician may be able to help you out, but if that's not possible, there's a great website called cannabisclinicians.org where you can seek out doctors or a service like Vera Heal, and we'll put the links to those down below. And just to be totally clear, this is even if you are using CBD with your child and you're in a totally legal state. Now, Corinne, you called one of these services, Vera Healed, and pretended that you had a child with autism. Can you tell me about that? Was it easy? It was a very easy process, and so don't skip it. Uh, if you can't find the support that you need local to you, find a resource like Vera Heal. We have no affiliation with them. It was just the one that we decided to call and test out. It was a very simple, straightforward process. And not only can you get a recommendation, but you can also, they can link you up with someone who can help you in the next step, which is ruling it in and ruling it out, figuring out which cannabinoids will work. It is always the tricky part when you're working with cannabis to figure out exactly what cannabinoids at what dosages work. Now, Dr. Goldstein gave a lot of guidance around this, and she talked a lot about what has worked in the past throughout this podcast. So please, if you're on step two, go back through, listen to what Dr. Goldstein has to say, buy her book, read her stuff. She has the experience of working with this particular population to help you navigate that if you can't find the support from your physician or from um, someone who has been down this path before. And then step three is to track. 
And we're not trying to make this an anxiety inducing or an overwhelming task that you have to add to your load. But because we're working with children who sometimes aren't verbal or able to communicate well, it's so important that we make sure that we know what we're tracking and how we're going to track it. I was actually just talking, Corinne, to one of our cannabis coaches who works with children with autism. And we were talking about what sorts of things it was going to be easy for that child's parents to track because the child was nonverbal. So they decided to start tracking sleep because that one was the easiest one to track. So this doesn't need to be fancy. You don't need spreadsheets. Um, there are some excellent apps that we'll put down in the links below, but even just writing it down on a piece of paper will really help you as you go through this process. And you'll be able to look back at what worked in previous days or even weeks. So this is also a super important piece of the puzzle here. That is so helpful. Even if you're not working with a child, tracking one thing is so helpful. People really want to track everything. They want a metric for absolutely everything, especially when they start using cannabis. They're like, but I want it to help with my anxiety and my pain and I want to sleep and I want to have a digestive system, glowing skin, all the things. And like, <laughs> Can you imagine the spreadsheet? You'd be so like out of your mind within three days. And that really is important in this. And I, I do love that idea of just tracking sleep, even if your child is verbal, because you can ask a child, you know, my seven-year-old, if I were to ask her how she was feeling in any certain Certain way, I could get a variety of answers that may or may not have good data in them. So sleep is a really good one. Thank you so much for that. We hope you found this podcast so helpful. Thank you so much to Dr. Bonnie Goldstein for being here today. If you have a story to share about using cannabis for a child who has autism or, or epilepsy, we would love to hear it. Please email us at support at wakeandbake.co or comment below.